are maybe not as relevant. Um, there is like the rhythm of a poem or how kind of how it flows, but I don't think you'll be asked about that. There's also the meter. Um, this is relevant in like things like Shakespeare. If any of you have read Shakespeare, um, sometimes it's written in something called um, iambic pentameter, which has to do um, with the pattern of the syllables that are stressed or not stressed. Um, and lastly, there is rhyme, right? I'm sure we all know what rhyme is, just making sure that, um, you know, the words at the end of the line um, sound the same. And that kind of affects the rhythm sometimes of the poem. And I, again, I think rhyme is self-explanatory. It's not very complex when they're asking you about that, if they even ask you about it. Okay, so really the takeaway points from this slide, I would say, Stanza is the paragraph in the poem, verses are lines, and a line break is, you know, when the line ends on the page in the poem. Okay. Um, and then we're going to get into some a uh, little more complicated terminology. Um, we have alliteration, right? So that occurs when you have two or more words starting with the same letter or sound. Um, so if you guys, if you guys have ever tried like the tongue twister, like Sally sells seashells by the seashore, the Sally sells seashells, that's all an alliteration um, because they all start with the same letter. And so I have put two examples on here of alliteration, right? If you say the slippery snake slithered, these three words would count as an alliteration. Um, and then even the slippery slide, because it is two words, okay? Same thing with tasty tacos. They both start with a T. Okay, yeah, someone gave me another good example. The big black bug bit the big black bear. See, it was hard for me to even say, but yeah. Okay. Um, all right, sorry. There's like some chaos going outside my apartment if you hear the background noise, so I'm sorry for that. Um, but anyway, that's alliteration. Then we have simile. So um, simile is a type of comparison that use the words like or as. So it has to use the words like or as, no matter what. Okay, so you can say someone is sly like a fox or someone creeps as quietly as a mouse. And so as we see here, they have the words like and as. Okay. All right, so that's a simile. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Then we have um, other poetic devices. We have the metaphor. A metaphor is a subject or an object in a poem that is described as something unrelated. So in this case, um, flame, not flame, sorry, fame is a bee right? Fame is not literally a bee, right? It's a comparison, but instead of using words like like or as, like a simile, um, it's kind of equating fame to the bee. So fame is a bee, it has a song, it has a sting, uh, too, it has a wing, okay? So this one even has some rhyme in it, this Emily Dickinson poem, Sting and Wing, okay? And we'll talk about this a little more. Actually, it's relevant for the next term personification, right? So that is when you attribute human characteristics to something that isn't human. So actually, in this example, in this Emily Dickinson poem, uh, fame is a bee, it has a song, it has a sting. I guess in that case, it is more like um, anthropomorphizing. So that would mean like um, making something sound like an animal. Um, but in personification, it has to do with like humans, right? So the sun kissed her skin as she lay on the, lay on the beach. Sun doesn't have lips with which to kiss, right? That's part of the personification. Um, and then the flowers dance to the voice of the wind. Vo um, wind doesn't actually have a voice, right? Um, and flowers don't dance like humans dance. So um, those are two examples of the personification. Um, okay, let's see. Then there is something called onomatopoeia, which is uh, the use of words that imitate sound. 
So things like buzz, whack, clang, cock a doodle do, these are all examples of onomatopoeia. Um, then there's also repetition, which again is pretty self explanatory. Um, in a poem, sometimes the author will repeat words, phrases, or lines in a poem. And usually that's done to highlight an important point or to establish a rhyme or a rhythm. Um, and so, again, I think in past webinars, I've specifically let you guys know when someone's repeating something, because usually um, that is done to emphasize a particular thing um, in the passage or in the poem. Okay. Then we have something called a hyperbole. So this is an over-exaggeration. Uh, it's usually used to create emphasis or humor. Um, so in this first example, we have, she scorched him with her radiance, right? Um, scorched is definitely an over-exaggeration, right? To scorch means to like, I think it means to like burn something or to like really dry something up. Um, and so like her radiant atmosphere or nature, I guess, scorched this other person, right? Um, or maybe in the second example, Mars cried out as loudly as nine or 10,000 men. So it sounds like here we have a simile too, because we have the as, but this is also a hyperbole because it's an exaggeration, right? This person, Mars, cannot cry out as loudly as nine or 10,000 men. That is just ridiculous, right? So that is why it's, a, it's an over-exaggeration. Okay. And then we have uh, something called an illusion. So this is a hint or a reference that's indirect um, and refers to a person, event, or idea that takes place outside of the poem. So in this Robert Frost poem we have here, um, it says, then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden, sank to, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day, nothing gold to, nothing gold can stay. Okay, so in this case, the illusion is Eden, right? So this refers to the Garden of Eden in the Bible, and so that is an idea or a text that exists outside of the poem, and that the author is referring to, okay? We do have some more terms here. Um, there is also, what is this? Sorry, okay. There's also an allegory which is um, a meta an extended metaphor in which characters, places, and objects carry underlying meaning, moral message, or political significance. So I don't know if any of you have ever heard of like Plato's allegory of a cave. Um, it's a story about these people that are trapped in this cave, um, I think who can only see their own shadows. I forget exactly the story, but you can always look it up. Um, and it has a greater meaning to it uh, that Plato wanted to communicate with his readers. And so I think this is a Langston Hughes poem. I should have put the author here. I'm not sure why I didn't. But anyway, um, it goes, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken wing, broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. Um, so I guess the allegory here um, would be that life is kind of meaningless without dreams to hold on to. And so this is an extended metaphor that holds true for, the, for the whole poem. And I want to bring out some other devices in this poem that we talked about already, right? So um, can people tell me in the chat Oh, thank you for whoever checked. Yes, this is Langston Hughes. Um, but can people tell me in the chat what poetic device this is? Life is a broken winged bird. Okay. So I'm getting different answers. So 
Someone said simile. That's a good thought, right? Because you're making a comparison. But remember, a simile has to have the words like or as. So life is a broken winged bird does not have those words. So therefore, it is not a simile. Someone also said personification. So this is not personification because it compares it to a bird, right? So person has to do more with human characteristics. Um, and then I'm seeing other answers here. It is indeed a metaphor, right? It's Life is being compared to a broken winged bird um, by saying that it is a broken winged bird, okay? Um, and so similarly, can someone point out another metaphor in this poem, you can just type it in the chat. Oh yeah, I'm getting the right answers here. Good, life is a barren field. Awesome, all righty. Good work, everyone. Okay. All righty. Um, nice. So let's move on. Okay, there are some other devices on here still. So we have something called an oxymoron. So that is when there are two seemingly contradictory or opposite ideas that are put together side by side or in a line. So for example, the term deafening silence, right? Sil something that's deafening is something usually very loud, right? So even if you said loud silence, that's an oxymoron because silence, you know, typically is quiet. Um, and then, or if you said like darkness visible or a visible darkness, usually like you can't see anything in the dark. So saying a visible darkness is an oxymoron. Um and then let's see, we have this other device called an enjambment. So that is when you just have run on lines because there's no punctuation. And um, we will go through some practice passages. So if I see one of those, I'll point it out. Um, and then lastly, imagery, right? All of you should know what imagery is because that's what you are all trying to um, create in your Hunter essays, right? So creating images for the reader to be able to picture. And so it is another version of a visual symbolism. Okay, let me see if there's anything in the chat. Nope, okay, good. All right, so I included, what is the point of enjambment? Okay, um, I think Francis Queller will send you the slides. The point of enjambment I think is to create a sense sometimes, it depends the context of the poem, but I think sometimes it's used um, to create the sense of movement and urgency in a poem because you're kind of like running through ideas without um, any like commas or semicolons kind of separating it through. Um, again, if I see it, I'll, um, I'll point it out. And if you want, you can always Google like enjambment examples in poetry. Okay, and then someone asked, would Shakespeare's writing honor without breach of honor count as an oxymoron? Maybe, because, I mean, that's literally the contra... I feel like... I would say no, because it has the word without. I think the oxymoron usually has, like, two words that don't directly point out the contradiction. Okay? Um. All right. So let's talk about this poem that we have here. Um, and let's just read through it first. Okay, so I'm gonna read through it and then we can um, stop and talk about what these things are pointing out. So this poem, always, 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 when you have a poem, I've mentioned this before, please read the title. Um, sometimes that will tell you a lot about the kind of um, kind of text you're going to get. And so this one is called Hard Frost by Andrew Young. So it says, Frost called to water halt and crusted the moist snow with sparkling salt. Brooks their own bridges stop and icicles in long stalactites drop and tench in water holes lurk under gluey glass-like fish in bowls. In the hard rutted lane, at every footstep breaks a brittle pane, and tinkling trees ice-bound 
changed into weeping willows sweep the ground. Dead bows take root in ponds, and ferns on windows shoot their ghostly fronds. But vainly the fierce frost in turns poor fish ranks trees in an armed host, hang daggers from house eaves, and on the windows ferny ambush weaves. In the long war grown warmer, the sun will strike him dead and strip his armor. Okay, this is actually a really tough poem, <laughs> but let's go through it. Um, so can someone or can people in the chat tell me how many stanzas this poem has? Okay, good. Everyone is saying three. Nice. Three poem paragraphs, aka three stanzas. Okay. Um, frost called to water halt and crusted the moist snow with sparkling salt. So I don't really care about this extended metaphor, but what is, um, actually there's a device that we talked about here, um, in this first line. Can anyone, um, guess what it is in the chat frost cult to water halt good personification right because frost is not a person it's the iciness right and so can't really call to water and water even is being personified right because you can assume that water is someone something that hears good okay and crusted the moist snow with sparkling salt Okay, we also see a rhyme here, right? Where my star is, halt and salt. Brooks, their own bridges stop. So this is saying brooks, like, you know, like little rivers, little brooks, their own bridges stop. So the brooks um, stop under their own bridges. Um, and icicles and long stalactites. Stalactites are like, I think they're like long icicle. I mean, actually, it already says icicle, <laughs> but it's like a type of um, rock, I think. Um, um, okay, all right. Um, and so there's a rhyming couplet here. A couplet just means two, um, two lines that go together. In this case, they go together because they rhyme. And 10-inch water holes lurk under gluey glass-like fish in bowls. So in this last line, we have a simile because we have the word like. Okay. In the hard rutted lane at every foot step breaks a brittle pane. So some more rhymes. And tinkling trees ice bound change into weeping willows sweep the ground. So I, I didn't really directly talk about assonance, but that is when... Um, you have like a group of syllables... Um, that kind of sound nice together, right? Weeping willow sweep. So you see a lot of like similar sounds, weeping, sweep, and weeping in willows, um, kind of having a poetic device that we talked about. What is the poetic device that weeping willows features? In the chat, please. Okay, good. Someone answered alliteration, great. Okay, good. Someone said rhyme. It is not rhyme because usually rhyme is the last word um, in a line that rhymes with another word in another line. Okay, so this is alliteration because they share the same um, starting letters and there's two words. Okay. Um, dead bows take root in ponds and ferns on windows shoot their ghostly fronds. Okay. But vainly the fierce frost, yes, see, so we have another one, fierce frost. Um, and then interns pour fish, rank trees in an armed host, hangs daggers from house eaves. Um, I'm not sure how that's a metaphor. Let me see. Interns pour fish, ranks trees in an armed host, hangs daggers from house eaves. Okay. Um Fierce frost is what's hanging daggers. So if anything, that's more personification, right? And I guess a metaphor. So fierce frost doesn't literally hang daggers, right? It's just the icicles that hang from the house eaves. Um, and daggers are like um, 
like big knives, sharp things. And on the windows, ferny ambush weaves and the long war grown warmer. The sun will strike him dead, more personification and strip his armor. Okay, and I guess it says half rhyme because warmer and armor don't um, fully rhyme. Okay, so we are, what is a house eve? A house eve, um, I think it's like a part of a roof, like on the edge of the roof. I would definitely just Google it to make sure that I'm telling you the right thing, but I think that's what a house eve is. Um, okay. So that was like a good review. And so now we're going to go through um, the poems that were already in Hunter Test 1 and Hunter Test 2. And I want us to analyze the different devices and then go through the questions. And then if we have time, um, I'm going to find some other, excuse me, poems for us to go through um, question wise. Okay. Alrighty. So let me adjust my iPad. Okay. All right. So this is from sample test one. Um, this poem is called Slanting, Slanted Figures. Okay. So the slanted figures pushing west on Madison were leaning against air. The wind, my mother said, is terrible. Her voice breaking um, inside that word. I was five, Marshall Fields Department Store. Actually, before I finish reading this, I should have asked this. How many stanzas are in this um, in this poem? Okay, good. Three. Nice. Okay. Um, can someone... So I didn't finish reading stanza one. Sorry. Okay. I was five. Marshall Fields Department Store was lost behind us. The wind had needle teeth... Its big flat hands were in my jacket, in my pants. Did I cry out? Okay. So can someone point out um, any poetic device in stanza one that stands out to you? Okay. Someone already sent me something correct. Yes. Yeah, we have personification of the wind. Good, guys. And that is in line six. So I hope you know how to read the poems, right? So this is line five. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so good. The wind had needle teeth. Its big flat hands were in my jacket, in my pants. Did I cry out? Okay, so as we said, good. This is personification. Personification. Okay. Um, let's see. The slanted figures. Ooh, good. Someone pointed out an enjambment. Nice. So I feel like this would qualify as an enjambment because this sentence spans four words. I will say that there is some punctuation. Um, but I think this could this could suffice as an enjambment. Um, and then someone is asking, can you show us how to count lines on regular passages? This is exactly how you also count lines on regular passages, right? So if they have a number, um, the one before 10 is going to be like minus one. So it's going to be nine. The one after will just be 11. And that's how you how you use them to find things in the passage. Okay. Um, the wind my mother said is terrible. Her voice breaking inside that word. Okay. All right, so what were we saying? This was Navy enjambment. This was like a run on. Okay. Um, and any main ideas from the first for the first stanza? What do we what is our takeaway from the first stanza? Please put it in the chat if you if you have it. Okay, good. I'm getting some right answers. It is cold. Yes, <laughs> right? It is very cold. And the author has written about the cold in a very show, not tell way, right? So in your essays, I'm bringing this in, right? You don't want to say it's cold. <laughs> you don't want to exactly say the wind had needle teeth either and copy this author's writing, right? 
Um, so just something to think about, okay? Okay, so it is cold. Good. All right, next stanza. She led me into some stone wall spinning door up on a sidewalk in the air, a protected crossing between office buildings. Suits and dresses stared at us. We saved two blocks, she whispered, as we took the escalator down and then we had to cross Chicago River, the Madison Street Bridge. Some years, my mother said, they ran ropes down the stairs of these buildings to keep people from blowing away. The river, thick as slush, but green, its ice mouth whispering, be careful, little boy, licked at what we walked on. The wind was in my shoes. Okay. So, second stanza. Any poetic devices that we can identify? Okay, a lot of personification. There's more than just personification here. Um... All right, there is actually, mm, okay, okay, metaphor, she led me to some stone wall spinning door up onto a sidewalk in the air. Okay, a lot of imagery, good. Okay. All right. So let's talk about it. So, um, suits and dresses stared at us, right? What suits and dresses are referring to people, right? People in suits and dresses, but taken literally, this is an example of personification. So I'm just going to write a P. Um, we saved two blocks. Some years they ran ropes down the stairs of these buildings to keep people from blowing away. This, I'm not sure if this is like a high, I think someone said a hyperbole. I'm not exactly sure about that because I feel like it could be true. Like sometimes there are hikes, like in national parks, that are very dangerous and they have like ropes so you can hold on. So I wonder, I wonder if that's just like a myth or like a rumor that she heard, but I don't think I would count it as like a poetic device. I think, or if it is, she's just letting us know how bad this wind is, right? How bad the wind is. Okay. Someone said um, simile, right? Good. There's definitely a simile here. The river, thick as slush. Okay, so the as is a simile. We have the ice mouth of the river, um, whispering, right, and licking what they walked on. That's definitely personification. Um, what else? Um, up onto a sidewalk in the air, protected crossing between. Okay, I don't think that she literally leads her son into the air. So I wonder if this, some of this is some sort of metaphor, um, talking about kind of like how otherworldly it is between the office buildings. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay, good. I think you guys got everything. All right. And someone even said, keep people from blowing away. That might actually be a hyperbole. Um, because people don't literally blow away from wind, right? Maybe a tornado, but not wind, right? So hyperbole question mark. These are all good thoughts, okay? I think for Hunter, they'll give you a more obvious hyperbole, um, like something really over-exaggerated. Okay, so let's finish the third stanza. My mitten held my mother's glove that held me to the earth and knew the way. Um to the Chicago and Northwestern station. Our feet were stumps, she said, inside, as the train jerked, groaned, and rolled into darkness, smoke and sparks, the conductor calling out, each pausing in the dark. I counted as home, Chicago's furthest and still unshoveled corner. Our snow was clean, our house its stucco white and tight, opened. From behind our kitchen window, we saw other trains, 
light sliding past, the city exhaling clouds of people into icy air. It's just terrible out there, my mom said. It, I just won't thaw. Okay, yeah, so all of you are giving me some good examples of personifications in the chat, right? So, ooh, someone gave me a good example of metaphor. Thank you. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's go through all the personifications first, right? So my mitten held my mother's glove, right? Actually, maybe. I think that works as personification. Um, someone also said our feet were stumps. This is good, right? Someone said, I mean, this is not good. <laughs> this means usually when you say your feet are stumps, that your feet are so numb, they feel like not feet. So that is a metaphor. They're comparing or letting the reader know what it's like to have your feet be extremely cold. Okay. Um, so this, it, what did I say this was? Our feet were, metaphor. Okay, metaphor. Um, and then let's see. She said inside, the train jerked, groaned, and rolled. So the train groaned is definitely personification, right? People usually groan. Um, I counted as home. Okay, snow was clean. We saw other trains, the city exhaling. So more personification, right? Um, it's terrible out there. I just won't thaw. Okay, so someone asked, is line 25 onomatopoeia? So it is not because it is a description of the sounds, not the sounds per, put into words, right? So... Um, an example of an onomatopoeia would be like heels on like tile or linoleum, right? You can say like click, clack, click, clack. That's onomatopoeia, the sound that the heels are making on the floor. Um, let me think of another. Usually onomatopoeia will be like in quotations because um, it's the sound that something makes like literally being said. Not like the clock ticked. So automatopoeia would be like tick tock, tick tock, right? But it wouldn't be the clock ticked. That's just the description of the ticking. Um, let's see. Someone said smoke and sparks. So smoke and sparks for alliteration is actually not alliteration because you need to have the words next to each other. So if it was... um. I don't know, seeing sparks or smelling smoke, that would be alliteration. But because it's separated by the word and, it is not. Okay. All right. Cool. So I think, can whoever's typing the same thing and sending it to me over and over again? Um, yeah, I think we talked about that. My mitten held my mother's glove. Alliteration conductor calling. Okay, good. Okay, I think we have, um, oh, I guess it's my mother. I'm sorry. My mother is an alliteration too. But at this point, I think we have all of them down. So let's, um, let's go on to the questions. Okay. Um, my mitten is also an alliteration. Good. Okay. Ooh, okay. Um, and yet it was cold, stuck down with frost. I was a snowman stuck down with glue. Does he say that? Mm. Sorry, I'm just looking to see what someone typed in the chat. All right, okay. Um, for some reason, I can't find that. But if you let me know what line that is, I, I will look for it. Okay, um, so now we get on to the questions. So here, this is why it's important to understand the terminology because right here they have stanza one. Okay, the people in stanza one are slanted figures because they are leaning into, okay. So let's go back to the passage. This is back to our reading comprehension strategy, right? Um, 
The slanted figures pushing west on Madison were leaning against air. The wind, my mother said, is terrible. Okay, so air, wind, it's probably going to be, the answer is probably going to be talking about air or the wind. Okay, so then we're going to go back to our question. And it says the people are sent because they're leaning into sea, a strong wind. Okay. All right. So you saw how simple it, the answer has to be. Um, you have to go exactly to where they're talking about the slanted figures um, and use that specific context to figure out the answer. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Number nine. So here in stanza two. The suits and dresses stare at the mother and her son because the mother and son are. Okay, so let's go back. We talked about the suits and dresses being personification, right? And actually being people wearing suits and dresses. And so um, remember how I also said that I felt that this could maybe be a metaphor about the sidewalk into air a protected crossing between office buildings. So this feels like otherworldly. Maybe they shouldn't be here because they themselves are not wearing suits and dresses, right? And so the answer for this question will be C, right? They, it doesn't say anywhere that they are um, shivering around this uh, sentence. Um, it doesn't say that they're poorly dressed, right? For all we know, I mean, their house sounds pretty nice in the last stanza. So there's no reason to believe that maybe they were poor or they weren't dressing um, properly. Okay. Um, whispering, no. And then appealing, no. So out of place because they didn't fit in with the suits and dresses. Okay. Um, and then we have number 10. In stanza two, the mother speaks to her son twice in order to. Okay, so let's go to stanza two. And so first she says we save two blocks. Um, and then she says some years they ran ropes down the stairs of these buildings to keep people from blowing away. Okay. So let's look at our options. To show off, to frighten him, to make excuses for herself, to provide information, or to comfort him. So definitely not to show off. Um, definitely not to frighten him. Um, definitely not to make excuses for herself. Um, I think... You have to think about what the best possible answer choice here is. So, you know, I'm sure she wanted to comfort him, but at the very bottom of it, she's trying to provide him with information, right? On how bad the wind is, um, on what their shortcut through the buildings might have done. It saved them two blocks. Okay. Um, all righty. So number 11 in stanza two, the boy describes the river as, okay, so we have, um, where is the river? Stanza two, the river thick as slush, but green, it's ice mouth whispering, be careful little boy, looked at what we walked on. Okay. So, Right, we talked about personification, so it definitely does sound like it's coming alive. Um, I would say it is described as a monster because, you know, its icy mouth is following them. Um, definitely talking to him because it's whispering. And let's see where exactly it says threatening the bridge. Um... Let's see. We had to cross. Yeah, it licked what they walked on. Good. And it also says we had to cross Chicago River, the Madison Street Bridge. So we know that they are indeed on a bridge. And it was threatening because it was licking what they were walking on. Okay, good. Um, Someone also said for the previous question about 
the suits and dresses that shivering works. Um, it actually doesn't say anywhere that they were shivering, not explicitly, right? So in this part here, until it says the suits and dresses, it doesn't really talk about how cold they are um, or how obvious it was to other people that they were cold. So it wasn't like they were necessarily staring at them because they were cold. Um, and then someone said, when two answers are likely correct, should you directly choose all of the above? Um, I think you should proceed with caution with that and make sure all of them are true just in case, because sometimes there are questions where maybe you think they all sound right, but really it's just maybe two answers that sound good with one answer sounding better. So some of these answers will be like the best possible choice, even though it won't be like the ideal choice. And so I would say definitely just go through all the answers and make sure that they are all true before selecting all of the above. Okay. All right. The train ride is described as, okay. So let's go back to the train ride. Um, doo, doo, doo. So the train ride is in the third stanza. And this is when the train, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. When the train jerks, groans, and rolls into darkness, smokes, and sparks, I count it as home. All right. So the train is separating. Um, like the city of Chicago, right? And then Chicago's furthest, uh, let me highlight this. So Chicago and Chicago's furthest and still unshoveled corner. And, you know, in between, it seems, I guess I'm giving this away. It seems a little otherworldly, right? It's dark, there's smoke and sparks. Um, and so the best answer in that case would be C between two worlds because it is literally connecting Chicago to the furthest end of Chicago. And there's this like darkness that um, is kind of undefined and the in-between between these two places. Okay, any questions about this passage? Okay. It looks like no. So give me one second. I'm going to move to Hunter Sample Test 2. And we'll do the same thing, analyzing the poem. And then, um, what's it called? And then answering the questions. Okay. All right. So here we have a new poem. It is called Experience, right? Again, always pay attention to the title. Um, let's see. Okay. This morning, I looked at the map of the day and said to myself, this is the way, this is the way I will go. Thus shall I range on the roads of achievement. The way is so clear. It shall all be a joy and the lines marked out. And then as I went came a place that was strange, "'Twas a place not down on the map. "'And I stumbled and fell and lay in the weeds "'and looked on the day with Rue." Okay. Any ideas to what this first stanza means? Any poetic devices that you see in it? I know this is a tougher one. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, this is like one giant metaphor, right? This is maybe what I would call an extended metaphor. Okay, so the map of the day is like the map of life, which I guess is a little bit easier to see as we go on. Um, but initially, he is saying, okay, this is how I will go. Everything is planned out. The way is so clear. 
It shall all be a joy on the lines marked out. Okay. Um, and so then he realized he comes upon something unexpected and strange. And um, it wasn't a place on like his planned map. Um, and so he has like, he has a realization, right? He stumbles and falls and lays in the weeds and he looks on the day with Rue. Um, let's see. Ooh, someone said repetition. A few people said repetition. Good. I like that. So he, you're right. He keeps on saying, this is the way, this is the way, the way is so clear, right? He keeps on emphasizing the way as if he's so sure of it, right? But as you will see, this whole poem is how the, you can't really rely on the way um, kind of always going as planned, right? There are some unexpected pitfalls. Good job, guys. I had missed that. So, okay. Good. All right, so let's read the second stanza. Okay. Um, I am learning a little, never to be sure, to be positive only with what is past, and to peer sometimes at the things to come as a wanderer treading the night, when the mazy stars neither point nor beckon, and of all the roads, no road is sure. Okay. All right. Any Anything, any goodies in here in the second stanza? Maybe an enjambment. A personification. Where is the personification example? Okay, when the mazy stars neither point nor beckon. Okay. All right, that's good. I'll take that for personification. Anything else? There's another, there's something else. Okay, yeah, so metaphor, they're continuing this extended metaphor. Ooh, good. As a wanderer treading the night, right? What um, what device is that? Anybody in the chat? Good, simile, nice. Okay, good. So here we have a simile. All right. So the narrator is saying... Oh, I didn't talk about the speakers. Okay, we can do that now after the end. Okay, so the narrator is saying, um, do, 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 uh, he can only be positive only with what is past, okay? And to peer sometimes at the things to come as a wanderer treading in the night. So he can only be certain of things that have already happened, but he should be skeptical with things of the future things to come, right? No road is sure. Okay. I think that's all the stuff that we have in this second stanza. Um, and then at the, in the last one, I see those men with maps and talk who tell how to go and where and why. I hear with my ears the words of their mouths as they finger with ease the marks on the maps. And only as one looks robust, lonely, and querulous, as if he had gone to a country far and made for himself a map. Do I cry to him? I would see your map. I would heed that map you have. Okay. So can someone give me... Um, the word of their mouth is not... Uh, words of their mouths. I don't, I don't know that I can call that directly personification. Um... Someone said simile. Where is the simile? Twenty. As if he had gone to a country far. Okay. Okay, I'll take that. Um, metaphor with the maps. Yeah, he keeps on continuing this extended metaphor with the maps. Um, and can someone give me the main idea for this stanza? What happens here? So someone says um, he does this to find help from others to continue his plan. So actually, that's not correct. Here, 
He's saying he's looking at other men who have their maps, who have their plans of their lives, right? And he hears the words coming out of their mouths and they look on their maps and they finger the uh, marks with ease. So he is basically saying he wants to warn them, right? That this is not always the case. Like you can't always be so sure of the maps. The future is unknown. Um, you have to heed the map, be careful with what you're dealing with, right? So someone said in the chat, he sees a bunch of people who are as sure as he once was, but he only pay, pays attention to the one who seems that they have struggled. Good. Okay. And so the guy who struggled is um, here as, and only as one looks robust, lonely, and querulous as if he had gone to a country far and made for himself a map. Okay. Good. Um, good. Okay. Everyone else who sent me summaries, very nice. Good job. Okay. Alrighty. So I think this is pretty much the main idea. We don't have as much um, personification as we did in the last poem, but there's still maybe some here and there, some similes. And again, this entire thing is an extended metaphor, right? A metaphor for like your life and your plans in life. Okay. So let's read through the questions. There's a lot of them this time. When the speaker mentions the map of the day, he is referring to. Okay, well, we, re we really hammered this one home, right? It's an extended metaphor for E, his plans and dreams, right? And so it's not necessarily a guidebook. It's he's talking about the future, right? Because in the second stanza, he mentions, you know, to be positive only with what is past. So these, this is like a hint that he's kind of talking about something bigger than just maybe like a guidebook or, um, you know, a literal map. He's talking about the future. Okay. And a guidebook is something literal, right? So again, we said this is a metaphor. Usually metaphors are more figurative. They, um, it's not a literal guidebook. It's not a literal map. Okay, number 11. The best way to describe the speaker in the first four lines of the poem would be, so we have here in the first four lines, right? So this is, um, let me get a different color here. This is one, two, three, four. So in these four lines, he is, yes, someone said confident, right? He's so sure of himself. He's using all that repetition. This is the way, this is the way I will go. Um, and so he is also saying the way is so clear, right? So the best choice really is going to be B, okay? Alrighty, and then we have 12. The change in the speaker in lines five through eight is a result of, okay, so let's go back five through eight. So that's these lines. Okay, five through eight is when he realizes that he comes across a strange place and that place wasn't on the map, right? Like that plan wasn't on his I don't know, agenda of plans, right? Like he did not expect this thing to happen. And so um, it's not the result of a minor injury, right? It doesn't say anywhere that he's getting hurt. It doesn't say a great fear, right? Um, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily an unfortunate encounter. Um, it would really be overturned expectations, right? He um, expected one thing to happen as his map or his plans and dreams dictated, but in the end, he came across something and his expecta expectations were overturned. Okay, number 13. As used in line eight, Ru means, okay, so we're going to go here. And I stumbled and fell and lay in the weeds and looked on the day with Rue. So 
again, when you have these kinds of words, sometimes it's helpful to think, oh, is this a positive word or a negative one, right? So it's definitely something with a more negative connotation because, um, you know, something negative is happening to him, right? He comes across a strange place, his expectations are overturned. So let's go back to the answer choices. So it's not indifference, right? Indifference would mean like not caring. So definitely not that, he cares. Um, not anticipation, he's not anticipating anything. Not terror, right? He's not like extremely afraid of something. And then delight is a very positive word. So he's not delighted. The best thing would be regret, right? He regrets maybe trusting his map and trusting that his plans and dreams would unfold as they should um, because this thing happened to him. Okay. All right. Number 14. When the speaker says that he learns to be positive only with what is past in line 10, he means that... Okay. I don't even think we have to go back for this one, but just for just for old time's sake. Okay, I am learning a little never to be sure to be positive only with what is past and to peer sometimes at the things to come, right? Maybe just like look at maybe what might come, but don't, you can't be positive with it because again, you know, it might change. So the best choice here would be B. He can't be certain of the future. That's the whole main idea of this passage. Okay. And so let's see, number 15, the men with maps whom the speaker referred to in lines 15 to 18 are, okay, we, I feel like we drove this one home too, right? The guys with the maps are super sure of themselves, right? Um, and we see this here as the, as they finger with ease, the marks on the maps, okay? So if they're really sure of themselves, Another word for that would be self-assured, okay? So that is the answer. All right, number 16. When referring to the men with the maps, the speaker says, I hear with my ears the words of their mouths to emphasize. Okay, let's go back. This one's a little bit tougher, okay. So, okay. Let's see. Um, I see those men with maps and talk. So maps and talk, right? Like, you know, you're all talk. <laughs> um, and that saying is like, you know, you're all words, but no action basically, right? So who tell how to go and where and why I hear with my ears the words of their mouths. So when he's saying that he, ref um, he's listening to the words of their mouths, um, usually you listen to meaning that come out of people's mouths, right? Like when they're communicating something to you. So words of the mouths, you know, just sounds like words, maybe not necessarily strung together with some meaning. And so let's look at the options, right? It's not emphasizing how much they talk, um, not how inarticulate they are, not the volume. It's not like they're saying it's loud or soft. Definitely not the directions. So really how little value he places in their words. They're kind of, you know, it's meaningless to him. They're all talk, right? Um, okay. And then number 17, the speaker likes the man described in 19 to 21 because, okay, again, I think we got this one. We really, we really did get this one without going back, but let's go back. Okay. Yeah, everyone's giving the right answer in the chat. Um, do, do, do. Okay, one looks robust, robust, lonely, and querulous, as if he had gone to a country far. So this one man um, has the experience, right? He found out what it's really like to fully believe that your plans and dreams will happen as thought out. So it's going to be A, right? Because the man has more meaningful experience. Okay. All right, I hope this passage is clear to everyone. Um, 
especially since I think this is the second time we're going through it, but here we're taking a more poetry spin on it. Okay. Um, oh my God, there's more questions. Okay, wait, before we go to more questions, someone asked, can you review uh, 16? Okay, so this is the one where they're saying, where the speaker is saying, um, men with maps, I hear with my ears the words of their mouths. So um, earlier in that stanza, he's talking about how um, he sees these men with maps and talk, right? And when you say that someone like is all talk, that means they're like saying a bunch of things um, that maybe aren't backed by like real evidence or sometimes, you know, that talk can be described as like meaningless. Um, and here I think he's very literal, right? He says, I hear he's very literal when he's describing um, what he's hearing. He's hearing with his ears the words of their mouths. Like he's just hearing the words. He's not really hearing any meaning behind them. Okay. Um, and so the best choice in this case would be E, right? He doesn't really hear the meaning behind them. He And that's because he places little value. Why would he place little value? Because he, he, he had the epiphany, right? That not, um, not everything always goes as planned. So um, I think this one is also one you can get by process of elimination. Um, when they say, um, I see those men with maps and talk. Ooh, sorry. Um, I don't think it's necessarily how much they talk, right? It's not like quantity wise. Um, inarticulate, right? It doesn't say that, you know, you can't really make sense of what they're saying. Um, not the volume, right? Again, it's not loud or soft. They don't really mention that. Um, and he really doesn't care about the directions they give, right? Because if anything, um, he says that they shouldn't heed the map, right? They shouldn't, I'm sorry, they shouldn't use the map. They should heed it, you know, use it as a warning. Okay. All right. Oh. Okay. Well, I guess I just went over number 18. Um, so as used in line 23, he means um, pay attention to, right? Beware of the map. Okay. Um, and we can go back to it, but really he's warning all of them. I would see your map. I would heed that map you have. Be careful of it, right? Pay attention to it. Okay, so that's that. Um, 19, throughout the poem, the speaker learns the importance of, okay, so this is like an overall question, but I think we really hammered in that main idea. Friendship and loyalty, facing the unknown and paving one's own way, following directions, planning carefully. So the best answer will be B, right? Um, definitely not friendship and loyalty. This is not about friends. Definitely not following directions on a map, right? That's literal. And as we talked about, this is an extended metaphor for something bigger um, and not planning carefully for one's future. That is the opposite of the main idea. Okay. Um, 20. The progression of the poem is from joy to despair, ignorance to wisdom, um, indifference to emotion, pessimism, and optimism, termination, disbelief. Definitely ignorance to wisdom, right? I think this one is, you know, I wouldn't be debating two answers for this one because the whole thing is about how he discovered the future is not always clear. So at first he was ignorant to it until he had that experience and then he became wise. Okay, someone did say E, determination to disbelief. Um, I think ignorance to wisdom is a better answer, even though I can see why you would say determination to disbelief. Um, I don't think he's necessarily saying that you can't believe in the map. You just have to pay attention to it and be careful with it um, because it's not always true. I get what you're saying, but it's better. With ignorance to wisdom is better because they were talking about how he really only cared about that guy in the end because he had the experience right and experience 
with things usually gives you wisdom because you've gone through it, you know um, kind of what to expect. So B is the better answer. Okay. And then, yeah, sorry, I did see your, your message about um, the word. So usually on the Hunter test, they will either underline the word or maybe italicize, or they will tell you actually in what line. But I think most commonly they'll probably underline it. Okay. All right. Does everyone feel good with this passage? I think, I think hopefully you do. Okay. And if not, you can send me a question in the chat. All right. Um, let me see. I just want to take like a two minute break before we move on to the next one. Make sure everyone's cameras are off. Okay, good. Okay, um, let's do the next one. So this next one is called disappointment. All right. Um, oh, I think this one will have some devices for us. So, um, oh my gosh, how many stanzas are there? I'll wait until you guys are done counting on this page and then I'll turn the page. Okay, I'm turning the page. How many stanzas? Okay, good. Yep, seven stanzas, nice. All right, okay. I'm stuck to a kitchen chair and the windows are steaming up as my aunt cooks breakfast. The Chicago Tribune lies on the kitchen table, but I do not touch it. I hear my uncle starting to climb downstairs, coming on his bad leg one step at a time. Okay, any devices in this one? Okay, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, it would be a metaphor, right? So I am stuck to a kitchen chair. He's not literally stuck to a kitchen chair, right? <laughs> so this is a metaphor, right? Maybe, you know, he doesn't want to get up out of that chair for whatever reason, right? And so he is stuck to it, not literally. Um, and so someone said here that it is um, personification. No, right? Because Ooh, he is a human. And I mean, I guess we would know that from the rest of the passage. He is a human. Um, and it's not like the kitchen chair is doing something that would normally be done by a human. Um, someone said hyperbole. I feel like this is more metaphor than hyperbole. It is an exaggeration. But this is more metaphor than hyperbole. I'm trying to think why I would explain that or how I could explain that. I think it's because like he's not literally stuck. Right? Hyperbole, I think, would be more of like, remember when we said that Mars was crying, like cried as loudly as, you know, nine to 10,000 men. Like that's like crazy, right? <laughs> Hopefully no one ever cries that loudly, right? So this is more a metaphor, I would say. Okay. Um, all right. So not much happening here aside from that. Okay. All right. The next one, the windows are steaming up. That's like a description. I wouldn't say that that's um, any poetic device there. Okay. Or maybe that's like imagery, right? Like you can imagine the windows steaming up. Okay. Um, I am the nephew here to be taken to the dentist. Others have sat in this chair waiting to be taken to the office, and I sit quietly. I'm 12 years old, knowing nothing of small talk. What would my cousin be saying now? There must be something to say, and my uncle appears. He is a man once tall, now slightly stooped and tilted to his strong side, wearing blue shirt and bow tie. His fine white hair comes straight back and still damp. He winks at me. I say, good morning, uncle. We eat oatmeal. I drink milk. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's some alliteration in here. Someone said that. That's good. I have some good imagery here as well. Nice. So, um, 
where did the person find alliteration? Slightly stooped. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's nothing too crazy though. Um, and someone said imagery, right? Okay. Um, alrighty. So then really here, I would say that this person maybe feels somewhat scared, right? He's sitting quietly. He doesn't know how to make the small talk. Um, okay. We park a long way from the office and walk. My uncle is careful climbing curbs, but I know better than to try to help. We enter the uptown building through the drugstore, its aisles still wet and smelling of ammonia. I watch as each one we pass smiles. Morning, Doc. How are you feeling? They all know him. Okay. All right. So, ooh, careful climbing curbs. That is a good alliteration. Okay, nice. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, probably just more line 22 metaphor. 21, 22. It's aisles still wet and smelling of ammonia. No, I think that's just a pretty good description, right? Wet aisles and smelling of ammonia. I watch as each one we pass smiles. So one refers to like a person um, and it's implied because they say morning doc, how are you feel? How are you feeling? So I don't think it's referring to the aisles. If it is referring to the aisles, um, then it would be personification, but I don't think it's referring to the aisles. I think they just mean like they're people. Um, someone is saying what's ammonia. Ammonia is a chemical compound uh, that's in a lot of cleaning products. Okay. So um, it's like in bleach and stuff that has like an ammonia smell. Okay. Um, let's see. Not, not a ton here. Basically, we see that this um, narrator is going to a building with um, his uncle who is a dentist, right? That's what they call him, Doc. Okay. All right. I stand in the 11th floor hall. My uncle fishes for his keys. Aaron Swartz DDS, and the ha hall is getting shabby. The doctor is in. That little sign, the office is frosted glass, remembered terror. Furniture from some Victorian parlor, my uncle whistling Beethoven, the sound of water. My uncle fills the Uptown National Bank building. He stand. oh, okay, that's it for this one. Okay, um, anything here? Okay, we have some repetition for uncle. That's good, right? This is the main figure that this narrator is looking to. Furniture from, yes, yeah, some alliteration. Um, bank building, yes, yeah, some more alliteration. I think I see um, a metaphor. Okay, so the metaphor, I would say, is the office is... Frosted glass, okay, maybe not that, but it would say the office is remembered terror, right? So that's a metaphor. Um, what? Okay. My uncle fills the building is a metaphor. Good, right? He's not literally filling the building. Okay, someone sent me a screenshot of the slide. Okay. Um, all right, good. Good. We have some good things in here, right? So now we can definitely tell that the, um, that the narrator is scared, right? Because we have that remembered terror. Maybe it's even a little creepy because the furniture is from some Victorian parlor. Okay. The sound of water... Yes, someone, sorry, sorry, I'm trying to think. Um, the sound of water is um, a metaphor as well because they're kind of comparing it to whistling Beethoven, okay? So that's good. Someone said that. All right, nice. So we have two metaphors. What did we say here? Metaphors. And then we have, yep, a metaphor here as well. Some alliteration that you guys pointed out. Good. All right. Um, 
I want you to see this. I think this is good for like your guys' essay writing. My uncle fishes for his keys. That's like a nice word, right? You can have that imagery of him like trying to fish in his pocket for his keys, right? I don't know. Maybe you guys are writing something about, um, you know, I grab my keys or my mom gets her keys from her purse. Maybe you can say like my mom reaches down into the depths of her purse and fishes for her keys, right? That's a better image that you could create in an essay you might be writing. Okay. All righty. So let's keep going. He stands at the window in the office whistling. He had his back to me is drying his hands. I am trapped in the chair and have abandoned hope. Actually, I don't need to highlight that. Uh, my uncle turns. Well, Kiplinger, let's take a look. As he gives a cigarette to an ashtray, a hand appears out of the corner of my eye. Large, stained with nicotine, is my uncle's hand. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anything here. Nicotine is um, the chemical in cigarettes i wonder this is definitely from the past because i don't think i don't know if it's used for um what's it called i don't know if it was used for dentistry for something or like if he was smoking and i don't know exactly but this is i guess just dating the the poem to sometime in the past he has his as alliteration good um Trapped in the chair is also another metaphor that some, someone pointed out, which is nice, right? He's not literally trapped. Um, gives his cigarette to an ashtray. Yeah, I kind of like that. That is kind of personification. Abandon hope. Definitely an over-exaggeration. Um, I don't know if I would call it hyperbole either. Hyperbole is like a really big exaggeration. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, someone also said that nicotine is an addictive ingredient in vape cigars and yes, cigarettes. Okay, all right. Um, then we move on. Again, we see how scared this person is, right? He says he's trapped in the chair and has abandoned hope, right? A little dramatic, but I get how the dentist can be scary. Okay, it holds something long and silver. It, I look straight ahead, mouth open, head back. Um, I see the sky blue and mocking me, hear his whistling, grip the chair, determined to show no feeling. Then there is a fla the flash of hurt. I grip the chair. I'm the stoic among my uncle's patients. I'm a butterfly on a pin. Okay, there's a lot of good stuff here. A lot of goodies, right? So we see the sky blue and mocking me. That's definitely personification. Um, metaphor, butterfly on the pin. Great. Um, let's see what else. Butterfly on a pin. Good. Alrighty. I think that's pretty much it for this one. So a metaphor and some personification. Um, again, he's gripping the chair. Scared, right? Okay. These are also good ways of showing not telling for being scared, right? Gripping the chair letting the reader know that you've abandoned hope, right? Maybe you could say like, my heart beats fast. These are all things that are pointing to the fact that, you know, someone is scared. Eyes open wide, pupils dilated, right? Okay, anyway, I endure. I am squeezing the arms of the dentist chair like a stiff while in the soft plum of my mouth, the drill grinds and grinds. I watch the wires flap, the drill winds and grinds. I wait for it to stop. It will have to stop. I'll give nothing away. It'll stop. I'll show nothing. It'll stop. Water trickles near my ear. My eyes are in the empty sky. I am 12 years old. I am my uncle's favorite nephew. I will not be a disappointment. Okay. So someone is saying repetition. Yeah, a lot of repetition, right? He says the stopping, right? I wait for it to stop. It will have to stop. I give nothing away. It'll stop. I'll show nothing, it'll stop, right? So a lot of stop, stop. So this is emphasizing that he really wants it to end already, okay? Um, my eyes are in the empty sky, good. Someone asked if this is a metaphor, definitely, right? Hopefully his eyeballs are not in the sky. Um, and then let's see, another one actually that no one has pointed out yet is 
the soft plum of my mouth, right? The mouth is not literally a soft plum. This is a metaphor. Okay. Um, good. There's also some emphasis, some repetition here. I am 12 years old. I am my uncle's favorite nephew. The repetition of I am, right? He is kind of reassuring. He's repeating this to himself. He is like reassuring himself um, because he's trying to be stoic, right? He doesn't want to show his pain. Um, and so he's like, okay, I can do it. I am 12 years old. I am my uncle's favorite nephew. I will not be a disappointment. Okay, so that's this emphasis that the repetition is creating. And this repetition is actually also here, right? I'm the stoic among my uncle's patients. I'm a butterfly on a pin. So that I'm can also be considered repetition. Um, Like a stiff. Yeah, that's a simile, right? Like a stiff. I don't know exactly what a stiff is exactly. Um, but I'm assuming it's something like that doesn't move and is stiff. <laughs> um, someone asked, what is a butterfly on a pin? So a butterfly is a very um, delicate creature, right? And a pin is a very thin little object. And so um, if he's a butterfly on a pin, he's like, he's maintaining his balance on there, right? But it's very like, it's something that's being compared to him being a stoic, right? Someone who doesn't show any emotion. Um, so he's doing something very precarious, very like, um, I guess like he's the only one who is the stoic among the patients. He's the only one that the butterfly is on the pen. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> okay, let me just Google a stiff because it might just literally mean like someone who is stiff, especially since... Um, we know this poem is from the past. Oh, okay. Well, um, Diego, I'm very impressed you were right. Did you Google that? Okay. Um, so a stiff is actually um, a dead body, right? That has um, definitely reached death. Um, that's called like rigor mortis. So that is what a stiff is stiff is okay thank you diego <laughs> all righty um okay good all right so diego had heard it before props to diego okay anyway um all righty so essentially this essay i mean this poem is about um this kid who's scared to go to the dentist but does not want to betray any emotion or let his uncle know that he is scared because he you know, wants to be the favorite nephew and um, wants to show that he has courage. Okay, alrighty. So let's, knowing all this information, um, let's move to the questions. The speaker does not touch his aunt and uncle's copy of the Chicago Tribune because um, he, not that he doesn't know how to read, right? He's not busy drinking milk. Doesn't say that they're late doesn't say that he is talking. He feels uncomfortable, right? He's very scared. Um, he knows what's coming for him, right? He's going to the dentist. Okay. In stanzas two and three, the uncle is depicted as, okay. So let's go to stanzas two and three. All right. So he's once tall. Um, he has his hair combed straight back and still damp. Um, everyone is like telling him good morning because they know him. Let's see. Let's see what the options are. Um, friendly. I think he is friendly, right? He's saying hi to everyone. Proud. Um, he's proud because it says somewhere in the poem that, um, the narrator knows not to um, try to help him, like get over the curb or something. Let's see. My uncle is careful climbing curbs, but I know better than to try to help, right? He can do it by himself. All right, proud, definitely aging, right? He's stooped to the side. He has trouble and professional. Okay, right, with the comb to hair and stuff like that. So it would be all of the above. 
Notice how I went through each choice. Okay. Um, 33. In stanza four, the speaker reveals his... Um, okay, let's go to stanza four. All right. So I think we talked about this remembered terror, right? So I wonder if that's what they're referring to. Okay, let's go back to the choices. Concern that the office is old, right? I don't think he is concerned about how old it is, right? Maybe that adds an element of fear. Oh, let's see here, fear of going to the dentist. Pride that his uncle is a dentist, no. Appreciation of classical, classical music, no. Enjoyment of old fashioned things, eh. So I would say fear of going to the dentist, right? That's the whole main thing. Um, someone asked for the Hunter test, is there partial credit for the multiple choice? No, either you get it wrong or get it right. Um, and I think this is a good time to say, if you're unsure of um, an answer, just bubble in whatever, just circle whatever, right? Because at least then you'll have what, like um, a 20% or 25% chance of getting it right if you guessed correctly, okay? So you will not lose points for guessing wrong, basically. Okay, um, 34. When the speaker says that his uncle fills the, be the building, he means that, all right. So someone said that this is a metaphor, right? He doesn't literally fill the building. Um, and I see here, um, he is a big presence, right? A, he, everyone knows him. He fills the building, he's professional, he's all those things that they said in question 32. So he is a big presence. It doesn't say he owns the building, it doesn't say it's crowd, the waiting room is crowded. It doesn't say he hired everyone who worked there and it doesn't say he's overweight, right? Phil is not literal. Okay, all right, 35. As the poem continues, the speaker views his uncle more and more as, Okay, not neat, not wise, honestly scary, right? And here, we can go back. But with each stanza after the fourth one, he starts giving us more hints that he's scared, right? He's trapped in the chair. Um, you know, a hand appears out of the corner of my eye. I feel like that's kind of scary, right? Um, he says, like, the sky is blue and mocking him. Um, he's gripping the chair. Um, he has that flash of hurt. Um, and then he's really squeezing the arms like a stiff. Um, and then he's saying, you know, he's repeating all this stop language, right? And so really, again, the main idea, once you get that main idea, you can probably answer most questions about any passage that you see because they all tie back to the same thing. Okay, 36. When the speaker says he is the stoic among his uncle's patients, he means that, okay, so I kind of gave this away in talking about it, but um, we see here that he says he's determined to show no feeling, right? Even though it says it hurts him. So he is the stoic among his uncle's patients. He's betraying no emotion because he's determined to show no feeling. So knowing that, let's go back. Okay. Um, do, do, do. It doesn't mean that he's not feeling pain. He's definitely feeling the pain. He just doesn't want to show it, right? He's not waiting patiently for his turn. He's already, you know, <laughs> the procedure's already being, being done on him. Um, nothing, I'm sure maybe he admires his, uncle talent, his uncle's talent, but I don't think that's necessarily the thing. Um, and it's not B, so it has to be A, right? He doesn't complain about how much it hurts because he doesn't want to show emotion. Okay, 37. The speaker describes his mouth as a soft plum to suggest that it is, okay, another metaphor, right? Um, so let's see what they say in 53. Um, okay, while in the soft plum of my mouth, the drill grinds and grinds. So let's see here. The soft plum is in contrast to the drill grinding, because grinding, I don't know, that makes me think of something hard, like stones grind against each other or um, something like that. So 37 is gonna be D, right? Um, it doesn't say that his mouth is 
you know, doesn't suggest that it's purple, brittle, or rotten. Okay. All right. And then number 38. In lines 55 to 57, the speaker reveals how he... Okay, let's go back to 55 and 57. So this is 55, 56, and 57. The drill winds and grinds. I wait for it to stop. It, okay, that's him repeating everything, right? Okay. Um, the speaker reveals how he... I don't think he's singing to himself, right? Um, he's not what, I mean, maybe he's watching his uncle. He's not advising his younger cousins. He's not speaking to his uncle. Really, he's kind of speaking to himself. But he tries to prove himself to his uncle because, sorry, I didn't say this, but he, he says here, I'll show nothing, right? In line 57. So this is him trying to prove himself to his uncle that he... You know, he's stoic, he's not showing emotion, he doesn't feel the pain that he's really in. Okay, 39. At the end of the poem, the speaker feels, I would say it's E determined, right? Because he says, I am 12 years old, I'm my uncle's favorite nephew, I will not be a disappointment. Okay, all right. Okay. Alrighty, so that was the end of this poem. I think we have time to work on one more. So give me a second while I find one. One moment. All right, I have found one. All right, hopefully this works. All right, nice. Okay, give me one second. Almost there, let's see. Okay, so first off, while I'm getting myself ready for this one, can you tell me how many stanzas we have here? in the chat. Okay, five. Oh my gosh, someone said this is their favorite poem. Yay, that's nice. Okay. Alrighty, five. Nice, okay. So this is called The Tiger, William Blake. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant, oh my goodness. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, all right, anyway. Um, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant sky? Oh, actually, let's start with this one. Okay. First stanza. Anything you see here? Um, some alliteration. Bright, burning bright. Okay. Good. Repeating. Tiger, tiger. Someone said fancy lingo. Okay. Right? The thy. Um, rhyme, right? Good. Bright and night rhyme. Um, okay. Alrighty. I think that's, I think that's good for now. Um, 
What do you think immortal hand or eye refers to? Maybe that's an illusion. Okay, I think that could probably be like um like a god, right? Someone who's like who never dies, right? Um what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Like who I think it means like who could have made your symmetry like so fearful or whatever. Okay. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of I th of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? Okay. Um, someone said burnt the fire of thine eyes. Um, some rhyme, right? Fire and aspire. Good. All right, some extended metaphor, good. Nice. Skies and eyes, I'm sorry, I missed that. Good job. Okay. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? Okay, art and heart. Um, and when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? Okay, beat and feet, chain and brain. Okay, good, more illusions. What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. Okay, we're getting some new things here. Obviously some more rhyme, okay. Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Okay, there's a lot of goodies in this one. Okay, more rhyme. What else is here? Um, okay, what is happening here? Um, some repetition, good. Good, that's what I was looking for, repetition and personification. So we have did he and did he. Um, and then we see personification, right, with the stars. Stars can't throw down spears, and they can't water heaven with their tears. Okay, all right, good, that's personification. Um, what do you think... Um, Ooh, nice. Someone pointed out there's some rhythm and meter syllable patterns in the third stanza. Apparently the syllables go eight, seven, eight, seven. Okay, good. I think that's like beyond this, beyond the hunter level, but I'm sure, you know, if you guys actually go to hunter, like in any other school that you're in, that's something that you talk about later on. Okay. Um, what is the capital he? Does anyone know? This is definitely an illusion. Yeah, like God, the Lord, God or deity. Good, good. Okay, nice. All right. And we have the capital his too. Okay, good. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Okay, what about this last one? Ooh, someone made a really good observation. The last stanza and first stanza are both the same but could is replaced with dare okay so here is dare and could very good all right nice all righty so let's get to the questions okay all right so what is 46 asking us the poet would probably describe best describe the tiger as okay this one should be an easy one for us right um this author really seems like you know they have a lot of respect for this animal um yeah i think i'm trying to think of a way to explain it so that it's b but it's definitely b and i think you guys all know it right he's a powerful tiger um you know, fearful symmetry, right? You you fear the tiger. It's powerful. Um, the tiger is not the tiger itself is not frightened. Don't get confused. 
Okay. Alrighty. Let's go to the next question. Oh my God, there's like only four questions here. This is crazy. Okay. What does the word art most likely mean in line nine? Okay. So let's go to line nine. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? Okay. So let's go back to the question and see um, what um, what we have here. Okay, give me one second. What is this? Okay. All right. Um, it's not music. It's not belief. Um, I don't think it's painting. Let's go back. So what is the art referring to? Who, I guess, first of all, who is um who is the speaker talking to the speaker is talking to the tiger right what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry okay so basically this whole poem is asking about like who made the tiger, who made him so powerful. Someone pointed out here that another way to think that the answer would be powerful 46 would be that um, he, the author contrasts it to the lamb, right? In line 20. And so the lamb, usually, usually the lion eats the lamb, right? So the lion or the tiger, not, yeah, sorry. The lion eats the lamb, the tiger eats the lamb. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is a predator and is more powerful. Okay. Um, and then what were we answering? We we're answering art. So he's basically trying to find out who, who made the tiger, right? And so, um, what the hand dare sees the fire. And this hand is referring to the hand of the person that made the tiger. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? Okay, so in this case... Art would most likely mean skill, and skill is referring to the skill that, you know, whoever made the tiger had to make it, right? Because the whole thing is questioning, like, who made your fearful symmetry, um, who made you so powerful, so on and so forth. So art refers to the skill of the creator. Okay, 48. In the third and fourth stanza, the author describes the tigers. Okay, let's go back. So three and four would be here. All right. Um, let's see. So they start with, and when thy heart begin to beat, right? This is the heart of the tiger, okay? This is the start of the tiger, right? The um, the start of his creation. And then here, the author is talking about like the hammer, uh, let me use a different color, the hammer, the chain, the furnace, the anvil, these are all things like in um, a, like a blacksmith would use to create like an object, right? So, um, Again, speculating as to who could have used the hammer, the furnace, the anvil um, to, to make the tiger. This is like a metaphor, right? This is like a big metaphor um, for creation. Okay, so let's go back to the question. The author describes, oh, well, I guess it would be A, right? The creation of the tiger from all the, using all those tools, the anvil, the hammer, the furnace, so on and so forth. Okay, 49, what does the poet, poet write that the stars began to do in stanza five? Okay. All right. So let's see here. Um, wait, what? Stanza five is here, but it doesn't talk about the stars. So I guess they mean stanza four. So 
The stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their um with their tears. Okay, so the stars are crying. Okay, and I know we said it's personification, um, but I guess, yeah, they're crying, right? They watered heaven with their tears. Okay. All right. This is a fun, this is an interesting poem. Okay, let's see. We have, maybe we have time for like another quick short one. So let me see if I can find... Okay. All right. And if we don't have time to answer all the questions, um, maybe at least we can just analyze the poem. Okay. Let's see. Give me a second. Okay. Um, this following poem is from William Wordsworth. I wander, I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud. Oh my gosh. Already something in the first line, right? Um, that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, ooh, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Let's just keep going. Okay, I will say that poem that we just did is, I feel like it's a little harder, but it's good to see hard things before your test, so that way you're not surprised in the event that the test does actually have hard passages. Okay. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched a never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves behind them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the shoe to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Okay. Alrighty. So let's go in. How many stanzas here? Okay, good. Four, right? Nice. And then let's go in the first stanza. There's a lot of rhyming, right? Cloud, crowd, hills, daffodils, trees, breeze. Okay, good. What else is there? Simile, right? Lonely as a cloud. Okay, good. What else? Dan fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Dancing in the breeze. Good. Personification. Okay, alrighty. Let's keep going. Second stanza. I wouldn't say a host of golden daffodils is a personification. A host can mean like not a literal host, like a host or a hostess, but like a lot of golden daffodils. Okay. Never ending line. Okay, maybe that's like a hyperbole along the margin of a bay. 10,000. Okay, maybe this is a better hyperbole. 10,000 saw I at a glance. Like, maybe I doubt he could see 10,000 daffodils at a glance, right? So that's like an over exaggeration. I would definitely call that a hyperbole. Um, how about continuous as the stars that shine? What is that? Similarly, right? Continuous as the stars that shine. Good. Um, alrighty. And then let's see. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a joke on company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the shoe to me had brought. Okay. All right. So dancing waves. Um... All right. Okay, let's see the last one. Um, sorry, that was personification for the dancing waves. And then the couch. Do, do, do. All right. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Okay, so when he's like um, lying vacant, when he feels empty in a pensive mood, 
um, they flash upon that memory, right? Um, which is the bliss of solitude. Um, the heart fills and he dances with the daffodils. Okay. So 31, let's go through it super quick. Let's see how many questions. Okay, not that many. Okay, which of these words best describes the author's emotional state when he is looking at the daffodils? Okay, good. Someone gave some meter um, rhythm. Um, all of the stanza four is eight syllables. Cool. All right, joyful, right? So he's like so happy seeing these. Where does he say? Um, he says at the end, like the his heart with pleasure fills when he thinks of the daffodils. Um, what else? He describes the daffodils very positively, right? He says that they're outdoing the waves in glee. He's saying, um, you know, that they're fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Those are very cheery, joyful things. Okay. Next, because we're going quick. In this poem, the lines of flowers are compared to D, a long stretch of stars, right? So we can go back and show that to ourselves in stanza two, right? Continuous is the stars that shine. They stretch a never ending line. Okay, good. That would be D, a long stretch of stars. 33, the author seems to indicate that the daffodils are um let's see i would say boundless right because the line that never ends he says that he can see ten thousand, but again i doubt that he can actually see ten thousand daffodils right um so it'd be boundless right no limits no bounds okay 34 what is the crowd that line three refers to made up of okay three 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 when all at once i saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils Okay, so he just saw a crowd of daffodils, right? So that would be B. 